But thank you so much to Sestra for inviting us and um, giving us this opportunity to share some of the research that we've been working on in this project uh, with everyone. It's it's a, one that we're particularly excited about um, and we're anxious to get um, everyone's thoughts and, and feedback on it. Um, the, the project dates back to the misty days of August 2020, um, which in our pandemic year seems like a really long time ago, um, at, which, at which point um, I received an email from a, a graduate student in clinical psychology, um, Kendra Terry, who I'm now happy to say is, is not only a lab member, but a, a full collaborator in, in the work that we do. Um, and Kendra wrote a very intriguing email um, saying that she was really interested in thinking through um, the discourse of, of clinical um, psychology or, or this course of therapy, sorry, um, in terms of some of the strategies that we in literary studies would apply to the work interpreting um, literary texts, particularly novelistic discourse. In other words, could we think of the therapeutic encounter as something that's available to hermeneutic inquiry, such as we in the humanities might understand it? And this was a fascinating question to me on two completely different levels. One, as many of you know, we at the Lit Lab are always on the lookout for interesting collaborations where we can take a lot of the strategies and, and methods that we've developed for analyzing literary text into different places and find new points of contact between the literary and the non-literary. Uh, but Kendra's interest also immediately reminded me of our own Anna Mukmal, um, who in many ways is the obverse half to what Kendra was interested in. Anna's work has centered on thinking through novelistic discourse um, from the perspective of looking for its point of contact with therapy, that is thinking through um, novelistic, context, uh, novelistic contexts as therapeutic. Um, and so I was very excited to invite um, Anna to be part of this project. And, and we were rounded out by um, Lisa Mendelman, who is a collaborator with, with many projects in the lab at, um, at Menlo College. And so the four of us for the past not quite 10 months have been trying to think through together um, how we can use the quantitative methodologies that we specialize in the lab combined with the close reading um, that, that all of us in our own ways are expert in, in order to begin to understand the differences and more importantly, the similarities between the discourse of therapy and what we might consider to be the literary discourse of, of novels. And so without further ado, I'm happy to pass this over to Anna, who will begin to talk about how, how we thought about and, and found this project in, in the theories that we're playing with. Thanks so, Mar so much, Mark, for that introduction. And thanks so much for having us to the SESTA seminar series. We're really pleased to be here. So as Mark started laying out, each of the collaborators on this project is curious about what is special about the therapeutic encounter. And we each bring different expertise to this organizing question. We're mobilizing methods from computational text analysis, literary studies, and clinical psychology to find points of contact between the therapeutic encounter, which we understand as a type of discourse, as Mark said, and other kinds of texts, particularly literary texts. So our central questions include whether the patient can be read as a kind of text, and if so, whether the clinical therapy session constitutes a kind of composite text. The ways in which protocols from literary studies and computational text analysis can be applied to psychotherapeutic discourse issuing from a clinical setting. How transcribed speech, in this case from therapy sessions, differs from other textual situations how the text of real therapy sessions compares to representations of therapy and literary fiction, which we call therapeutic encounters, as well as to literary dialogue more broadly. And finally, and this is the crucial experiment on which we're going to focus in our talk today, which parts of 20th and 21st century literature look the most like therapy sessions? Now, we wanna make really clear at the outset that our project departs from some approaches to therapy in the digital humanities with which you might be familiar. These studies attempt to use statistical analysis on a given text to infer its author's personality or even its author's mental health. For example, can we use statistical methods 
to guess whether someone who wrote a given text or a group of texts is experiencing depression or trauma. Some of us have critiqued this kind of analysis in other venues. Uh, and we wanna underscore that at no point in this talk will we be diagnosing or pathologizing literary characters based on their forms of dialogue, nor will we diagnose literary authors based on their writing style. Instead, we're interested in the relationship between the discourse of therapy and the discourse of literature, as well as how we can apply similar interpretive strategies for unpacking discourse on both the literature and therapy side of the would-be discursive divide. So here's an outline of our talk today. First, Kendra is going to provide some theoretical notes on therapy as a hermeneutic discipline and the therapeutic alliance to provide a conceptual backdrop for today's presentation. Then I'll describe a corpus that we assembled for the purposes of addressing some of the earlier questions on the previous slide. Third, I'll establish some basic, basic statistics, which will help us contextualize our findings in the modeling therapeutic discourse experiment. Mark will describe the methodology of this experiment, and then we'll all come together to discuss results and interpretations before we open it up for the Q&A, which again, we're really eager to hear your feedback and questions and thoughts. So I'll open it up for Kendra to start with the theoretical notes. So as we keep hinting at, uh, we can think of therapy as a sort of hermeneutic discipline, uh, and in particular, one in which the therapist interprets or performs a sort of close reading of the patient's discourse. Um, so borrowing from thinkers across history, the history of hermeneutics, philosophy, and psychology from Aristotle, Schleiermacher, Delphi, Heidegger, Freud, Gadamer, Orange, we can start to think of, we can start to form ingredient, a list of ingredients for therapy as a hermeneutic discipline. So with the patient as text, what type of reading do we perform as therapists? So one, there should be a sort of meta awareness of self, that is an awareness of transference and, and counter-transference as we say in psychotherapy or of the therapist and the patient's feelings directed towards one another. Uh, two, there should be an acknowledgement of therapy as a type of discourse with structuralist type rules. For example, the uh, inherent power dynamic, the purpose of free association or the co-construction of meaning. And third, we can think of a tolerance for messiness. So to be able to hold space to circle around what feels perhaps like meaninglessness material um, unless land, uh, sorry, until landing on a central issue. Um, and fourth, the sensitivity to the language as the medium of psychotherapy. So paying attention not only to content, but the way in which the material is expressed. Also to have a knowledge of historical context. In other words, an acknowledgement of the patient's and therapist's life experiences and also the historical context in which they're situated. Six, to have an understanding of this process of reading as curative in itself. So reading symptoms as signs, manifest content as latent content, uh, and generally undergoing a process of translation. Uh, and here we're reminded of the classical adage to make the unconscious conscious. So taken together, this carves out a space for therapy as foremost a process of interpretation and ultimately uh, therapy as a hermeneutic discipline. So in psychology, there's something we call the therapeutic alliance, and this will become uh, important when we start, start to talk about our corpus. Uh, the therapeutic alliance can be summarized as the real relationship between the patient and therapist. So the part that is undistorted, authentic, composed of trust and mutual respect. So we can think of sort of all, all high theory and ideas about how the therapist should position him or herself with respect to the patient aside. It's simply the relationship on a very human to human level. Uh, and we can think of the therapeutic alliance as a sort of prerequisite for change across all different types of therapeutic modalities, um, which reminds us of what's called the dodo bird hypothesis. 
So in Alice in Wonderland, I'm sure you're all familiar with this story. Uh, there's a moment when all the characters get wet and are trying to figure out a strategy to dry off. And the dodo bird suggests that everybody run around to get dry and at the end proclaims everybody has won and all must have prizes, uh, regardless of sort of how long they ran around, where they ran around, how they, how they chose to dry off. Um, and so in psychotherapy research, there's been evidence that despite all the different modalities from psychodynamic to CBT, DBT, mindfulness, the single most important factor is the therapeutic alliance itself. So just what we're talking about here. Um, so that is to say all therapeutic modalities are winning and all must have prizes. Uh, and just lastly, the, the therapeutic alliance. So in a 1979 paper by researcher Edward Borden, the therapeutic alliance was operationalized, so broken down into tasks, goals, and bonds. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and in relation, so in direct relation to the therapeutic alliance, we see rupture and repair. So referring back to Borden's conceptualization, rupture is a disagreement on the goals of treatment, the failure to collaborate on the tasks of treatment and or a strain in the emotional bond. And from there, rupture can be broken down into two broad categories. So withdrawal in which the patient moves away from the therapist and confrontation in which the patient moves against the therapist. And here you can see, so this is called 3RS, the Rupture Resolution Rating System. Uh, this is a way to qualitatively code therapy sessions for rupture. So you'll sort of, you can watch through a recorded session and you can mark moments in the therapy as having elements of withdrawal or confrontation. Uh, so in a moment of withdrawal, for instance, we might see a patient in denial or a minimal response to a therapist's inquiry or a, a patient's sort of turn towards abstract communication. So for instance, example, an example of this would be the therapist might ask a patient how an experience made them feel to which the patient replies with a sort of vague existential language about the nature of thoughts and feelings. Or in a moment of confrontation, we might see the patient complaining about the therapist or rejecting an intervention. For instance, here, the therapist might suggest say a visualization they might suggest that the patient visualize what it's like for the patient to be in the middle of an argument with his partner. Uh, and instead of following along, the patient might mock the visualization as a valid technique. So those are some examples of uh, withdrawal and confrontation in, uh, in the rupture of the therapeutic alliance. Thanks, Kendra. So we're going to begin now with discussing the corpus we built for comparing therapy sessions as text and other kinds of text. So we have four subcorpuses that comprise our comparative corpus. First, obviously, the therapy sessions themselves. So this subcorpus contains 10 patient therapist dyads. For each dyad, we have one rupture session and one non-rupture, or what we're calling our control session, according to the coding structure that Kendra just described. So each of these 20 therapy sessions lasted between 45 and 50 minutes which represents the standard analytic hour. When transcribed, each session contains approximately 7,500 words. So these therapy sessions were archived between 2005 and 2010. So we don't expect any generation effects here. And while of course, appropriate efforts have been taken to respect the anonymity of both patients and therapists, we do know that each therapist is distinct. So we know that we don't have the same therapist with 10 different patients. This indicates that we've, to the extent possible, mitigated the therapist equivalent of the author signature, signer, signal. I want to really want to call that a signature. So for comparison to the text of these therapy sessions, we composed a second subcorpus of literary therapeutic dyads, the full array of which I'll show you on the next slide. For now, just hold in your mind that we selected 50 20th and 21st century novels and memoirs with an average publication date of 1964. Our third subcorpus addresses how transcribed speech of therapy sessions differs from other conversational situations. So we turn to 45 episodes of the podcast On Being with host Krista Tippett. Each of these episodes yielded us around 8,000 words with air dates contemporaneous with the therapy sessions. 
This third subcorpus is still a relatively structured conversation on a given topic. So we ad adopted a final subcorpus that represents the far extreme of informality, a selection of high quality Buckeye conversation transcripts from 2001 in which 40 Ohio State University students converse freely in an unscripted way with an interviewer who's asking them questions. So our corpus's heterogeneous composition allows us to examine how the text of therapy sessions compares to novelistic therapeutic discourse, to novelistic dialogue in particular, to structured conversational venues like interviews, and to informal or unstructured conversation. So as promised, I'll zero in for just a moment on all 50 of the literary therapeutic dyad texts. We selected some of these texts based on their thematic investment in therapy. For example, you can see on the slide, Portnoy's Complaint and Lolita. Others prominently feature doctor figures or patients from Infinite Jest to Mrs. Dalloway. We also chose formally experimental novels such as Three Lives and The Passion, as well as novels that place narrative weight on conversation like The Sun Also Rises, Nightwood, and Outline. These texts formally represent a kind of pressurized telling. This is a term that Gavin Jones and I have been talking about together, or it basically refers to this need to talk and this need to be heard. In this way, these texts reflect a theory of therapy as serial self-expression and listening. And that's a phrase that comes from Mark McGraw. In other words, we've constructed this subcorpus with the idea that formal experimentation and dialogue is a discursive hallmark of literary engagements with psychotherapy. So what did we do with these four subcorpuses? One of our most generative lines of inquiry was a part of speech analysis or POS. So this part of speech chart shows the proportion of each part of speech, as you can see listed at far right, in each subcorpus that we just described. The first column is the therapy sessions, the second Buckeye conversation, the third on being, and the literary therapeutic dyads are broken down further into 7,500 word excerpts in the fourth column and only the dialogue from the therapy novels in the fifth column. The final column compares dialogue from the Chicago Corpus of American Fiction with dialogue from our bespoke literary therapeutic dyads corpus. Notice here that the therapy sessions are extreme outliers in their proportion of nouns. At just over 11%, nouns feature much less prominently than in any other subcorpus. Therapy sessions are also extreme outliers in terms of their proportion of verbs. At 23.3%, verbs feature significantly more prominently in therapy than in any other subcorpus. And to examine statistical significance, we calculated two key HSD for nouns, verbs, pronouns, adjectives, and adverbs. And you can see the statistical significance on the slide. Our most important takeaway here is that almost a quarter of the words of therapy sessions are verbs. And for verbs, you'll note that all of these differences are statistically significant. We think that this demonstrated focus on verbs or the process of doing and working through therapy aligns with these therapy sessions predominantly psychodynamic approach. So if our big conceptual question here is what distinguishes therapy sessions from normal conversations, the two biggest factors in terms of parts of speech are therapy's decreased reliance on nouns and increased reliance on verbs. We wanted to zoom in on the therapy sessions increased reliance on verbs to ask what kind of verbs are these? So here you'll note that verbs are all in shades of blue at the bottom of each bar. The simple past in the darkest blue is not higher proportionally in therapy than the other subcorpuses. So we can preliminarily conclude that the simple past alone does not explain therapy sessions high reliance on verbs. But if you look closely, you'll note that there are roughly double as many present participles in therapy sessions as in all the other subcorpuses. Present participles, of course, are the form of a verb used in forming continuous tenses, ending in ing in English. For example, I'm thinking or I'm giving a presentation right now. This verb form is inherently process oriented, which accords with the idea that these therapy sessions are about working through the unfolding dyadic encounter between patient and therapist. Kendra will come full circle later to this idea of working through, 
But for now, we wanted to show you another experiment that we did as a form of baselining. So the cartoon is kind of just for fun. You have to let go of the baggage of your past in therapy. But we also wanted to illustrate that this is a really big cliche of psychotherapy, that it's past oriented. And uh, this even uh, applies to contemporary critiques of therapy, especially psychoanalysis. So the stock critique that patients are encouraged not only to think too much about themselves, but also to spend way too much time thinking about the past. So we wanted to see how much time patients and therapists actually spent talking about the past, the present, and the future to get an idea of what we're calling the temporal space of therapy and how it compares to that of our comparison corpora. So if one of the members of this project, it's Lisa, she's not here today, has wisely theorized the temporal dynamics of therapy as thinking about the past and the present in a future-oriented way, we wanted to be able to comparatively visualize the temporal space of our subcorpora. So to do this, we made use of a tool called LOOC, or Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, which is a tool developed by the American social psychologist James Pennebaker to uncover how the words we use in everyday language reveal our thoughts, our feelings, and our motivations. So you might be familiar with this tool, but in case you're not, LOOC is used frequently in the social sciences to examine how categories of word meaning are present in different types of texts. So basically what the LOOC makers have done is go through the dictionary and tag words that pertain to different categories. In this case, we made use of the LOOC time orientations, so past, present, and future. So we could count their occurrence across our corpus as a preliminary measure of temporal space. So on the slide are some examples of the words that make up each time orientation. And if you're curious, there are more. This is just a selection. So we wrote a code that counts the number of words that belong to the loop past, present, and future time orientations in each subcorpus. And here is what we found. One of the first things we found is that contrary to the stereotype and according to these time orientations, all of our subcorpora focus on the present much more than the past and even more so than the future. It bears noting that the therapy novel excerpts are most past oriented by far, but we think this is more a reflection of the genre's disproportionate reliance on past tense narration. We can also see that therapist rhetoric is distinct in its focus on the present and the future, whereas patient rhetoric tends to resemble on being and Buckeye in the ratios of past, present, and future. Underscoring this point about future orientation, therapist discourse for rupture sessions has the highest percent of its temporal terms as future oriented, 8.25%, with control sessions in second place at 7.91%. So just quickly before we move on, something that interests us, but we can't answer this hypothesis with this particular data set, we do wonder if a given patient's present and future focused discursive temporal space would increase over the course of their time in therapy. In other words, whether they would start talking less in past-oriented terms and more in present and future-oriented terms as they're in therapy over time. Whether or not, and in part as a result of coming to mimic or model the therapist's present and future-oriented focus. But of course, we really have a snapshot in time with these therapy sessions. We don't have diachronic um, samples. So we can't do this experiment, but we would like to if we could expand our sample. So all these results connect to something Kendra is going to talk about with conceptual underpinnings of psychotherapy as process. So thinking about the parts of speech and the temporal space findings together, the ones that Anna just talked about, uh, we can come up with a preliminary interpretation that goes back to this idea of the process of therapy. Um, so intersubjectivity is a relational psychodynamic concept of the psychological field that exists between the patient and the therapist, where there is not one, not two subjectivities, but the space of the intersubjective third that forms as a sort of emergent property of the two. With intersubjectivity, we see an emphasis on the ongoing interplay or process of interacting subjectivities. And in relational psychoanalysis, which is where we draw our corpus from, uh, it's the process of co-creating this intersubjective space that's inherently therapeutic. And this goes back to the idea of the therapeutic alliance. Um, thinking back to the Dodo Bird hypothesis of the therapeutic alliance, in the space of intersubjectivity, the 
experience of the relationship is therapeutic. So we see patient change happen through the ongoing development of the therapeutic alliance itself, a development of and moving through the tasks, goals, and bond. As a preliminary interpretation then of these findings, we see verbs as re representing this interplay of two subjectivities, less focused on concrete objects as represented by nouns and more on the movement of the relationship in this way, particularly in the present moment as shown by the temporal space findings. So now that we had uh, our therapy corpus baseline, that is we understood the ways in which it departed from and some of the ways in which it was aligned with the other discourses that we had after examination, we returned to the original question with which we began this project. How could we understand the points of contact or were there points of contact between the discourse of the therapy sessions we had been exploring and what we might consider to be literary discourse, specifically, the discourse in novels, and not just in the list of novels that we've already looked at, which were chosen explicitly because of their um, potentially therapeutic content, but rather in novels in general, are there places that are unlooked for regardless of, of the subject matter or the thematics of the particular novel, where we might be able to see resemblances between what we'd identified as therapeutic discourse with all of its attendant theoretical schema that Anna and Kendra has explained. So we decided to capitalize on these differences we had found and turn to machine learning in order to create a model that might help us identify these points of contact in a, in a very material way that we could then turn and analyze. So we set up the experiment uh, like this. Um, we decided on two different feature sets. As we've already seen, part of speech does a really good job at differentiating between therapeutic discourse and other kinds of texts, particularly novels. So we decided to start off with that. We create a feature set out of all of the available parts of speech in the pen tree bank and see if we could train a computational model to recognize the difference between therapy and an equally sized group of novels based on part of speech. Um, then we decided to also move on to semantics as, as that's frequently the question we ask ourselves. If part of speech can tell the difference between therapeutic discourse and, and other kinds of talking, um, could it also be evident in uh, the semantics of the, of the, of the texts themselves? We also needed to estimate what we'd consider to be the minimum size of the therapeutic encounter. That is, at what scale would we be able to see these resemblances, these potential resemblances between therapeutic discourse and between our novels? Um, and we alighted on 500 words, and it's, it's a number that we're pretty confident about, but not entirely stuck on. The trick here is that if we chose too small a segment, it might be that there's not enough text to recognize the kinds of resemblances we'd hope to see. If we chose too much, that is if we chose 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 words, it might be that uh, these kinds of encounters which have resemblances to therapy uh, might be too small and we would lose them in the noise of a, of a segment that size. So we selected 500 words and we established our two corpora. On the one hand, our therapeutic discourses, which Anna has already talked about. And on the second hand, Anna and Lisa went through a large corpus of novels um, and identified segments of novels that were the same size as our therapeutic discourse corpus, uh, but which did not have any kind of resemblance that they could tell uh, to therapy. In other words, we wanted to give our model the best training data available in order to establish the differences between them, thinking that if we could do that and we could successfully create a model with a high degree of, of probability that was able to differentiate between these two kinds of discourses, we could turn it loose on a corpus of novels to identify places where it couldn't tell the difference. That is those points of contact that we wanted to find. So our part of speech feature set can contained all of the parts of speech um, counted throughout the text. Our semantic feature set, we decided to go with the 75 most frequent nouns, the 50 most frequent verbs, the 50 most frequent adjectives and adverbs. And we calculated these separately and created two different models in order to see if based on either feature set, we could train a computational model to tell the difference between therapeutic and novelistic discourse.
And uh, so the part of speech feature set um, that I've just described, which is all of the uh, part of speech in the tree bank, you can see here, um, I've arranged it from top to bottom and left to right in terms of what is the most predictive of therapy according to our model and what is the most predictive of a novel. And you can see that some of our original hypotheses were confirmed. Most predictive of therapy are present tense verbs as well as personal pronouns and the word two. Um, most predictive of novels are an emphasis on nouns, that is concrete nouns, both proper and non-proper, as well as, as uh, verbs in the simple past. Um, so this really confirmed our initial uh, set of hypotheses uh, that we derived from our baselining of the corpora. The model run with part of speech, as you can see, was enormously uh, successful here. Um, the left column represents the uh, non-therapeutic texts and all of the ones colored blue, which is all of them, uh, were successfully classified by our model as uh, non-therapeutic um, or as uh, novels. Um, the right side is the gold bar, uh, the mostly gold bar is uh, our therapeutic text, that is the text from the therapy discourse. And as you can see, except for one example, all of the therapy tests were successfully classified by our model as therapy. Um, this is a leave one out cross validation, which was 99.8% successful. These are not the type of numbers we used to see posted when we're doing computational text analysis. The model had no problem distinguishing for the vast majority of cases between therapeutic and novelistic discourse. Turning to the semantic feature set, as I said, this represents those 75 top nouns, the 50 top verbs, and the 15 each uh, adjectives. And again, I've arranged it from the top left um, as most predictive of therapy to the bottom right as most predictive of novelistic discourse. And again, um, there's not a whole lot that's surprising here. Most predictive of therapy are those contractions that we get in speech, as well as a kind of epistemological discourse of knowing and thinking. This will be important. On the other hand, most predictive of the novel, again, are those past tense verbs said, of course, because novels are heavily dialogic in a way that um, therapeutic discourse does not have to announce when people are talking, um, as well as had. Uh, but also the kind of concrete nouns that we found were actually very interesting. Eyes, face, hand, voice, hands. They seem to be very, uh, very particularly focused on concrete nouns having to do with descriptions of body parts. So this was our feature set for our second um, classification, which much like the first uh, turned out to be remarkably successful. Again, on the left, you can see that it successfully classified all of the novel excerpts as novel. Um, and on the right, this time it wasn't quite as successful at classifying all the therapeutic excerpts as therapeutic. Um, there were three that it missed, although those are interesting and we'll be happy to be talking about those in the Q&A. But overall, it was 99.5% effective. So between these two models, we felt that we could very usefully turn these loose on our large corpus of novels um, and see what that returned. So the second phase of the experiment, um, which I've explained here, um, we found we used the Chicago corpus that Anna's already alluded to of 9,088 20th century novels. We divided all of the novels into that 500 word segment that we said was indicative or was the size of the window at which we would be able to recognize therapeutic discourse. Um, but we slid that window across. We didn't make hard divisions. So each overlapped um, half of its length with what came before and after. This left us with just over 4.3 million individual segments of novels to test in our model to see if any of them misclassified as therapeutic. In other words, this would help us identify places in novels that for in many, most cases, none of us have read um, that the model did recognize as being more like therapeutic discourse than novelistic discourse. And this would be either based on the part of speech, based on the first model, or semantics based on the second model. So I've represented visually on the next slide um, the results from the part of speech model. It's a little bit difficult to read until you, until you get the trick of it. Um, but the way it works is that each dot in this diagram is one of those 4.3 million novel segments. 
experience, and its position to the left or to the right indicates how the model understood it. That is, the farther towards the left it is, the more the model classified it as a novel. The farther towards the right it is, the more the novel classified it as therapy. Now, considering all of these experts, all, all these 4.3 million came from novels, it means that everything to the left of the diagram is one of those misclassifications uh, that we were interested in. I should note that the up and down position, the x-axis or the y-axis, um, is just jittered to be able to see all of the different dots so they didn't just lie on one line. So that's, that's not particularly meaningful. Now, you might look at that and say, oh, it looks like you had so many excerpts classify as therapeutic. I thought you said the model worked very, very well. Well, in fact, let me assure you, it did. Uh, the black line that you see on the left-hand side represents the average classification, um, the mean probability of our model um, of, of any given therapy, of any given segment that we pass through uh, the model of being therapeutic was only 1.1%. Over 50% of all of the dots on this diagram lie to the left of that line, which means the vast, vast majority were correctly classified as novels. But this means that we still had about 45,000 segments that were misclassified as therapeutic that we could start to examine for what they were and why they might be misclassified. Now, our semantic model worked, in fact, a little bit better, which you can here you can see that there's a much uh, sparser array of, of dots. Again, each one represents one of those 4.3 uh, million uh, novel segments. Um, and uh, the average line, um, which was just off of the, of the left-hand axis on the last graph, here is sitting precisely on the left-hand axis. In other words, here, the semantic model was so successful that the mean probability of any given slice being misclassified as therapy was only 0.07%. Um, that means that, again, over half of the um, dots on this diagram lie to the left of that line, which is why you can't see them because they're all on top of each other. Um, so we had less material to work with, but in some ways, because they're semantically misclassified, um, it's actually uh, an interesting um, set that we'll be able to work with. So we had a about 1,230 segments that had an over 50% probability of being therapeutic. So knowing how the model classified, having identified these segments of novels that we could then go and say, okay, what's going on with them? Why were they classified in this way? And knowing how they were classified, that is knowing what the feature sets responsible for the classification was, we then decided to dig into them, um, use our skills as close readers, apply the hermeneutics of interpretation, and, and begin to interrogate what novels look like when they're misclassified as therapy. So... Thanks so much, Mark, for explaining the model. And as you promised, we're going to look more closely at some of the novel excerpts that our model misclassified as therapy with a probability approaching 100%. So we're going to present to you three misclassifications by part of speech, and then later four by semantics. So shift your mind back to the part of speech feature set, and then feast your eyes on this excerpt from Jonathan Kellerman's Private Eyes first published by Bantam Books in 1992. So in this New York Times best-selling crime suspense thriller novel, itself the sixth of a series, which I did have to do a significant amount of research to about this text once it cropped up in the misclassifieds, you have a character who's uh, Dr. Alex Delaware, who's a child psychologist, who gets a call from his patient 11 years after working with her in therapy when she was seven. So patient's now 18. But this is a flashback from when uh, she first calls him as a child. So I'll just read a bit of the excerpt. What can I do for you? CV. I need help. I'm AV. Yes? Silence. AV. Hello? Are you there? CV. I. I'm scared. AV. Scared of what? Dear? CV. Everything. Dun, dun, dun. So note the sort of hyperstructure dialogism here with AV and CV forming a therapeutic dyad that's visually demarcated on the page. It almost, you can read it almost like dramatic speech turns. This is something we saw quite frequently in our novel excerpts that were misclassified as therapy by part of speech. We also see a lot of unfinished sentences, interrupted sentences, implied content, and lots and lots and lots of repetition. 
Note how many times uh, Melissa, danger, and scared is repeated in this passage. Now, what's fascinating to remember here is that all our model has to go off of is the part of speech of each of these words in each excerpt. It has no idea about the identity or profession of the characters, the subject of the novel, or anything about the actual words themselves other than their part of speech. It misclassifies this excerpt as therapy, or as another way of putting it, it recognizes this is a therapeutic encounter despite its fictionality based on the parts of speech alone. It is not misclassifying the excerpt as therapy because of the semantic content of the words, but rather only their grammar. So to underscore this point, the next example that Kendra is going to close read doesn't have therapeutic content at all. So just to say again, remember in the second, second example, all the model knows is the part of speech of each word in the excerpt. In other words, it's looking at the POS feature set that we saw earlier in the presentation. So here we find an excerpt from William Gaddis's satirical 1970 novel, J.R., about the American dream in which a schoolboy disguises his identity through, through payphone calls to amass a fortune in penny stocks. To read a subset of this excerpt, uh, the bolded part on the top, the speaker says, no, but, no, but, wait, hey, I, no, I know I said that, hey, but, no, I was going to tell you, I just found that out too, but in addition to its first person narration, the novel is formally experimental, no chapters, shifts in focalization, almost entirely in dialogue, but without clear demarcations of which character is speaking. The plot of JR involves no therapeutic, no therapeutic content uh, as compared with the last one we saw, revealing that what the model is detecting in the POS misclassification is something that we might call therapeutic form. Here we see the repetition of words and phrases, note the number of no but hey waits, unfinished and interrupted sentences, loaded statements and implied content where the speaker does not make it to the nouns of the sentence going back to the POS results we saw earlier. In this last example um, from the mind body problem, which was uh, brilliantly described by its publishers, quote, a hilarious underground bestseller about one woman's pursuit of carnal pleasure, carnal pleasure and the philosophy that gets in the way. Um, we see a different way of understanding the movement into therapeutic discourse. Um, if you look closely at the highlighted parts, um, what we have is a turn not towards therapeutic discourse, but into formal logic. The protagonist of the novel um, is a philosophy student. And in her various argumentations and sort of working through of her daily life, she frequently turns to the discourse of philosophy, which looks very much to our model like the discourse of therapy. Note the single past tense verb, I was suspicious, which immediately moves into a second, a, a, um, a sorry, present tense, not even second person, but um, abstract discussion. One cannot challenge A and B since they're simply assumed for the sake of argument, D looks assailable, et cetera, et cetera. This takes place not just in the dialogue, this present tense um, sort of uh, working through of process, but also in the narrative, in the confessional mode that dominates the novel. Um, this we feel like is what pushes this away from novelistic discourse and towards therapy. Note also that the two people who are in discourse here are married. So that adds another level of complication. So Noam, the person she's talking to is a world renowned mathematician. <laughs> okay, so shifting to our semantic misclassifications. Uh, so we're shifting from part of speech or grammar to misclassifications by semantics or discourse. So here's a first example misclassified by semantics. This excerpt is one of the most infamous scenes from David Foster Wallace's 1996 work, Infinite Jest, in which the narrator tries to articulate the inarticulability of clinical depression while focalizing the character Kate Gompert in an inpatient psychiatric ward. Talking about depression, the narrator says that it's not just unpleasant, but literally horrible. It is also lonely on a level that cannot be conveyed. There is no way Kate Gompert could ever begin to make someone else understand what clinical depression feels like. And then later, the second bolded excerpt, 
the description of suicidal ideation, the person in whom it's invisible agony reaches a certain unendurable level will kill herself the same way a trapped person will eventually jump from the window of a burning high rise. So on the one hand, this misclassification by semantics demonstrates literal therapeutic content in the narrative, narrative itself with phrases like clinical depression and psychotically depressed, while also discussing, particularly in the latter part I read, the subjective experience of depression. In this way, it's unsurprising that David Foster Wallace is misclassified as a therapy text, but perhaps attests to the accuracy of the semantic classification of the model. Crucially, however, we wanted to start out with this example uh, because we can see in the mechanics of our model, if you remember the semantic feature set that Mark showed earlier, that it was not these explicitly diagnostic words, such as clinical depression, that determined the misclassification of this novel excerpt as therapy. Rather, it was the words around them, from contractions to mean, know, think, etc. In other words, the model made its classification without relying on the most obvious clinical vocabulary that shows up in this excerpt. We wanted to show you another excerpt misclassified by semantics. This comes from Fran Dorff's 1990 novel, A Reasonable Madness, in which psychiatrist David Goldman is obsessed with the beautiful, wealthy Laura Wade, and you can see them in dialogue here. So Laura, claims she can kill with her psychic powers, and she's confessed to a murder, leading Dr. Goldman to question his most basic beliefs. That's all according to amazon.com. And as soon as I read that, I put it in my cart. So in this conversation, the therapeutic dyad discusses the kind of voices that Laura is hearing, which she describes as almost like pre-thoughts, the thoughts people screen out before they speak. Another highlight of this session is Laura talking back and telling Dr. Goldman not to look for paranoia in her speech. There's quite an example of therapeutic rupture when Dr. Goldman says, Laura, let me help you, complete with his hand on her bare shoulder. It's like 1950s therapy movies. You can't help me, doctor, she responds. No one can help me. I can try, Laura. For all of this cinematic encapsulation of the dynamics of embodied therapy and their sexual dimensions, if I can just register that, not all of the excerpts misclassified by semantics feature such straightforwardly therapeutic content. In other words, a patient character and a doctor character in dyadic conversation, which shouldn't be surprising given the fact that our semantic feature set is actually surprisingly less clinical than you might expect. In other words, and what we really want to highlight is that even though there are no explicit therapy words in our semantic feature set, we're still finding novel excerpts that misclassify as therapy, which points us towards a theory of therapeutic discourse that's kind of beyond the merely clinical or diagnostic. So these last two examples that Kendra and Mark are going to close read importantly suggest a kind of therapeutic discourse beyond the interdiegetic representation of therapy. So starting with this one that Mark's going to read, sorry. There you go, Mark. I'll actually take this one. Thanks, Anna. Um, so this, uh, this misclassified example comes from Gertrude Stein's Wars I Have Seen. Uh, while Stein's experimental fiction tends to be an outlier in many digital humanities experiments, we decided to include it because like most of our misclassified excerpts, uh, it's misclassified by semantics without representing intradiegetic therapy as we saw in the two previous examples. So reading the lower bolded passage. And so I was a little girl in East Oakland, California. And of course, one did have to find out that life, although it was life, there was death, although there was death. And you had to find out that stars were worlds and moved around and that there were comets and that there was wind and rain, grass and flowers and birds and butterflies were less exciting in California. So to perform a little bit of a different uh, close reading, here we think of contemporary psychoanalyst Donald Stern's theory of unformulated experience. Unformulated experience is the sense we have before we have made meaning out of it. As Stern describes, the perceptions, ideas, and memories we prefer not to make are most often murky and poorly defined, different in kind than they will be when the process of completion has progressed to the level of words. 
So here in Stein's excerpt, we have a monologue that conveys a sort of meandering working through. These are not organized categories of thought or of experience processed and tied up. The death and stars and worlds and comets and wind and rain. They are mere gestures, feelings in their raw polysyndetonic form. Here, the protagonist experiences coming into form from content without shape to symbolic representation, from unformulated experience to meaning. So in this last example, um, which comes from Henry Miller's Rosy Crucifixions trilogy, um, Miller describes a turbulent period of his life in this largely autobiographical work. Um, he's, he describes himself as caught between his ex-wife, who he's still attracted to, um, and the woman who he was pursuing and will eventually marry, um, as well as how in this milieu his identity as a writer was forged. Um, in this particular scene, which again was misclassified as therapeutic, um, Miller's avatar within the the book named Henry um, is describing an encounter with both women to a friend Rebecca who also serves as a kind of avatar for Henry Miller in the novel um, and in this scene uh, Rebecca is urging him to write down his observations not only on both uh, women but on life itself to turn his thoughts into the material of the novels that he will eventually write. Now in this passage Miller is working through his conflicting feelings for both women in relation to his fundamental belief in differentiation and hierarchy presented in diegesis as the working through of his philosophy and fantasy, Miller's avatar, avatar resorts to abstract analogies, not focusing on the confessional mode that much of the novel is written in, but offloading his process onto an imagined interlocutor, a you that is partly Rebecca and partly the reader who is interpolated into the monologue. This creates a dialogue even more intimate than that represented as, as being between Miller and Rebecca. This in the moment process of present tense, contractions, um, all of which are attached to this you, and his focus on the epistemological acts of knowing and meaning bring, we argue, this passage into the discourse of therapy as far as our semantic model understands it. So to return to our opening questions, first about interpreting the therapy session as a kind of text, and second about comparing the text of real therapy sessions to literary fiction, we reach a pair of observations. Specifically, we see that for the part of speech classifications, our model tends to misclassify heavily dialogic, structured speech, most often in the present tense and or highly repetitive text in novels as therapy text, suggesting the building blocks of a therapeutic form. That is to say, in therapy, it's not just that we tend to talk about, as far as the semantic classification is concerned, our model tends to misclassify novel excerpts as therapy sessions when they feature interdiegetic therapy or therapeutic content, intimate interpersonal conversation or argumentation and or a quality of working through as we've been talking about here. So the material we've shown here represents just one part of a much longer and larger project on the interplay of therapeutic and literary discourse, one which is ongoing. And we now invite any and all questions and comments in the Q&A, so thank you so much. Thank you, every, uh, both. Anna and Kendra and Mark for that presentation. Uh, first, I wanna um, invite all participants to use the raise your hand feature. So that way I, um, I can call on you and you can uh, ask the presenters yourself uh, any questions that you may have. And our first question goes to Elaine. Thanks, Will. Um, that was great. Really, absolutely fascinating. Um, sort of slightly troubling in some respects in relation to the to the to the kind of functionality of fiction, right? But anyway, that's that's the sort of aside. I've got one methodological question, and I've got one uh, sort of sort of broader question. I think I'm really interested in that Luke thing. What that Luke, whatever it is, yeah, yeah. Can you parse out the non-finite verbs for me? Because you talk about, you talk, tense seems so very important. 
but some of the examples that you gave were non-finite parts of verbs, right? So said and was, you, the example Mark you talked about was I was suspicious, but what if, what if the collocation was I was going to, I was going to go, right? So how much, what, what role does collocation play in the way that you define tense? Because non-finite parts of tense, the auxiliaries, modality, et cetera, isn't gonna give you the past, present, future in the context of the, of the discourse. Okay, so that, that's just a methodological question. My second question then is sociolinguistic, which is really interesting. And I'm sure that you, you know, I know you, you'll already be onto this, but in those examples that you gave, and particularly the one that Anna was reading, um, where there was interruption and repetition and hesitation as characteristics of therapeutic discourse, those are also characteristics sociolinguistically of women's speech. Uh, previously regarded as powerless and now kind of redefined in terms of collaborative and and so on. So what role does does gender play then in the therapeutic discourses you see it emerging, particularly, I suppose, less from the actual therapy and much more from the kind of novelistic and possibly stereotypical um, stereotypical kind of uh, replication of imagined women's speech. I can speak to the methodological um, question, and um, I'm, I'm super interested in the other one um, as well. Um, but I think the thing to remember is that we measured temporality in three different ways within this project. That is, one, the part of speech features. And the part of speech features do, in fact, take into a language you're calling sort of the collocation of the context of a given word, right? So a present, um, a present perfect, um, discourse would appear different from a past discourse, even though some of the verbs might be the same. At the same time, um, we also measured it simply in the lexemes, that is in the semantics. So, um, so there are like the word said, for example, which showed up as incredibly significant for our model in terms of deciding novels, that is the word said whether or not it is part of just a simple past or a more complex um, grammatical construction. And then the Luke words actually aren't verb dependent at all. Um, those mostly deal with, um, I would say nouns and adjectives predominantly um, that are sort of words looking forward and backwards. Um, and so by triangulating, I think, between all three of these different ways of understanding, the kind of strictly grammatical, um, the semantic in, in particular contexts, and then the more abstract Luke terms, I think that's where we came up with this understanding of the temporality of therapy versus, versus novels. I can jump in just for a moment on the methodological question. First, thanks so much, Elaine, for the question, two really fantastic questions. Uh, I actually have the Luke time orientations pulled up on my screen <laughs> right now um, in front of you all. And I think, Mark, to nuance what you're saying, Elaine is right that uh, verbs are pretty well represented in terms of the uh, words that Luke has associated with a focus on the present, a focus on the future, and a focus on the past. Uh, for example, I'm looking at present focus and a couple of the words, they're in alphabetical order. A couple of the first ones are admit, admits, uh, appear, appears, are, aren't. However, you also have, uh, as Mark's saying, a lot of uh, actually not so much nouns in present uh, focus. In future focus, you see more nouns because you see things like destiny, fate. Uh, you also have the verb form faded, which could appear, you have fates. You also have, uh, interestingly, like vernacular English, so like fixin' to do something. I'm giving this presentation from North Carolina and we, people, people talk that way here. So there's both nouns and verbs, but the question of uh, non-finite verbs is a really good one and something we should consider further in how we present our temporal space uh, results in particular in that kind of, that chart, which is striking perhaps because of its uh, simplicity. <laughs> Um, on the question, I'm really curious to hear what Kendra in particular has to say from her clinical experience about the role of gender. And while I know that we can't reveal the genders of our patients uh, in our therapy sample, much as I myself would really like to know, um, I think that we are registering this question of gender in a pretty uh, interesting and admittedly very time consuming and complex way. Uh, these are not results that we got to present today. But also on my screen, I have a very dramatic spreadsheet cataloging every single misclassification by both POS and semantics. 
And what our team is doing is going through and close reading every single one of them. So as you know, we only presented seven, uh, three by POS and four by semantics. We have thousands to work with. And what we're doing is we're trying to see if by close reading them, we can catalog various uh, different types of um, things into an ontology. So for example, is it dialogue or is it narration? If it's dialogue, are there speech turns? If there are speech turns, can we perceive the gender of the interlocutors? If we can perceive that, can we also determine uh, the relationship between the interlocutors, which sometimes is made manifestly obvious and sometimes it's not as much and we have to do further research. So at the end of the day, what we're hoping to be able to do is to say therapeutic discourse is imagined in you know, X number of misclassified excerpts from novels that are misclassified as therapy is imagined as predominantly feminine or among women, or it's not, or it's predominantly among doctor figures, or it's not. And uh, I can't give you statistics today because we're still going through them, but largely we're seeing that uh, the kinds of people who are engaging in therapeutic dialogue according to our model are imagined much more broadly than the simple doctor patient dichotomy that we showed in some of the excerpts. For example, we see a lot of friends, we see a lot of self-talk according to uh, the, the Gertrude Stein excerpt that Kendra went through. And we see a lot of um, even business associates, a lot of lovers and a lot of uh, married people, also a lot of legal proceedings in court. So I'll stop there. It's a great question about gender. Kendra, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add. Sure, I just wanted to add something sort of peripherally related. I think, Aline, you mentioned beyond gender per se, uh, the role of sort of power dynamics. Uh, and uh, just this is something I think that we want to look at a little bit more going forward, but going through and sort of cleaning the transcriptions of the therapy corpus, um, we noticed some interesting sort of power plays that interjections played an interesting role. So. Uh, it was the therapist who would say, or sorry, it was the patient who would say things so, kind of more passively interjected. Um, so like, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then the therapist would say things like, right, yes. So more affirmative. And so that's something just a little bit, you know, tangentially interesting to look at power dynamics as represented in the, the sort of usage of language in interjection. Uh, and that's something we've talked about looking looking into as you know, uh, yeah, related to gender. Thank you. Michaela. Um, so this was, this is really fascinating and I don't have a terribly focused question, um, but I have a variety of questions surrounding the particular role that dialogue plays in this. Um, I may be wrong, but I'm assuming that your transcripts of therapeutic session consists mostly of spoken words, um, maybe entirely of spoken words. Exclusively uh, spoken words. Yeah. And I guess I'm sort of wondering why that's not what you were looking at in literary texts, right? Why not say play scripts with the stage direction script out, stripped out? Um, why not novels with the non-dialogue parts stripped out? Um, just because it seems like a lot of what you're detecting is simply, as you yourself say, dialogue. <laughs> and, um, and it seems like to get at what specifically therapeutic, I mean, I can see some of the interpretations heading there, but it does seem like that's the central thing about what's present tense versus past tense. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that dialogue ends up being more present tense than, than past tense compared to the other things around it. So how does, how does the simple formal structure of represented dialogue um, as a thing that is emplaced within other forms of discourse in novels, how does that affect your results? Did you think about looking at more specifically dialogic uh, corpus, corpora um, in various ways? Because it does seem like that's the way in which the literary corpus is unnecessarily an outlier in amongst all your other corpora, because everything else seems like it's transcripts of spoken words and the literary corpus is not. Um, or maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're going after. Um, so return to our, I'm sorry, Anna, did you want to? I was going to say, if you want to take uh, the part about Chicago and focalizing just the dialogue and yeah. So if you remember our baselining of the corpora, that you echoed my immediate suspicion, which is that really we should be looking at representations of dialogue in novels if we want to find these points of contact. Um, so if you think back to the way that Anna presented it, um, we started off 
by comparing um, the therapy discourse to the places that Anna had identified in her own work as sort of these therapeutic sections of novels. But then we also had a representation of those where we did exactly what you suggest, stripped okay. everything but the dialogue, tested it against that. And we still found that there was this really big gulf between represented speech and novels and therapeutic discourse. And that's okay. why we moved on to the podcasts and then the conversations to see if we could figure out what was where these gaps existed. And, and did that come out the same with um, the other formats you were looking at, like memoirs, or, or as I, I, I really am curious about like something like, a, like dramatic play scripts as a format? Yeah. A so question. we don't, we don't have any dramatic play scripts in there, but that would be very easy to clean um, because you just strip out who's speaking and then you have the speech terms in the same way that we cleaned the therapy sessions. So we could definitely go there. It would require a little bit of like argumentative uh, framing and sensitivity to the fact that novel dialogue is not the same as uh, dramatic speech terms. Uh, but to kind of to answer your other question, uh, Michaela, oh, I can stop my share now, sorry. Um, to answer your other question about why we, when we trained our model, we looked for excerpts of a certain length rather than only looking for dialogue. Uh, so in the modeling therapeutic discourse experiment, the reason we looked at both narration and dialogue is because we were actually kind of curious about the narration parts too. So we kind of knew or expected or hypothesized that we were gonna get mostly dialogue. And indeed in the spreadsheet to which I was referring, the very long complicated spreadsheet uh, all on my screen right now, the vast majority are dialogue. And we'll be able to say, you know, 95% are dialogue or are dialogic rather. Um, but we were kind of interested in those outliers in which narr predominantly narration uh, is getting picked up either by POS or by semantics as therapeutic. And we wanted to kind of figure out what that meant about, uh, about therapy, about novelistic discourse, and about the points of convergence. So that, that's, that's hence why we wanted to try to capture both. Does that kind of yeah, you know, thank you. I, I I clearly just missed that detail on that on that chart, but um, but I, I it, it does seem like I kind of I I, st I still want at the end when you're doing the interpretation a kind of um sorting out of the examples where what you're capturing is dialogue, but you also say that you're capturing something about process from the past, like because it does it does seem like I'm not quite sure how 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 easy that is that is to sort to sort out the, the, the these different dimensions um, but anyway thank you yeah yeah of course i feel like kendra probably has smarter things to say than i do about the experience of being in a psychotherapy session and the connection between dialogue and process i don't know if you want to say anything now kendra but well so again sorry to just put everything to further research um but uh it's I mean, for sort of separate projects that, you know, might come together with where we go with this, um, to look at the at nonverbals in therapy is something that's really interesting to me. And on a certain level, all verbal representation is about content, right? Because the words are talking or we're representing certain things. Um, and it's the nonverbals that represent process. So it's like the silence and the repetition as we saw in some of the uh, novel excerpts um, and the things that are sort of around the, the verbal usage uh, that are indicative of process. So that, I mean, that would be just a whole nother area of research and the coding for that, as you can imagine, is much more complicated than just sort of running these programs through a program like Luke or some of the other programs that, that are used at the Lit Lab. Peggy. Thank you. Um, thank you all for this very, very amazing talk. Um, so I have a very basic fundamental question about the so-called bespoke archive, um, which I just don't get methodologically. And I think, Anna, maybe you could take it up, particularly in relation to the OSU transcripts. I, I, my, my fear or my worry or my, it's a, it's, a, it's a question, it's a genuine desire to understand. Um, how those choices are made and what the risks are um, in terms of outcomes. Like, couldn't it be the case that you, as it were, you know, in, in social sciences, there's something called demand characteristic where the, the data is sort of corrupted by some of the choices that are made. So I'm sure you and Mark have thought 
really carefully about this, but for an outsider, you know, somebody new to all of this, I don't get that first move of a bespoke archive. And then I have no understanding of what the OSU transcripts were about. So if you could just put some more light on them. Thank you. Of course. Mark, do you want to talk through the process from bespoke to completely throwing it wild on Chicago? Or do you want me to take the bespoke corpus first? Um, I would say, and, and Anna, you can sort of nuance everything I'm about to say. I think the process, Peggy, that we were interested in, and, and this is something that we follow a lot in the lab, is that we want to draw upon our skills as expert readers. Before, before we dive into a found corpus, um, which is much, much larger, not bespoke, but comes with its own attendant difficulties and dangers, um, that is, any corpus, um, any corpus, uh, regardless of how big it is, is necessarily incomplete, and it's not incomplete in random arbitrary ways. It's always biased. Um, and so the advantage of the bespoke corpus is one, that it's smaller, so we can do things quickly. Thanks, Kendra. Um, and two, that we know where its biases are. Um, I've also read every single text that's in it. So if an excerpt pops up, I, because I, most of these were from my orals reading list, for example, I can immediately say, oh, I know exactly which character this is. I know the dialogue, it's therapeutic or it's not, versus in the very long cleaning process that I was referring to with all of our thousands of misclassified excerpts, I have no idea who these characters are because I've never read these novels in Chicago. Um, anyway, sorry to interrupt you, Mark, but no, not at all. And that's that's kind of the point, is that this serves as a pilot study through which we can see the ways in which um, the kinds of things we want to do will behave, so that then when we turn to the larger corpus, um, that is the non-bespoke corpus, we're able to adjudicate the results of that based upon our knowledge of the behavior of the models that we're creating within this smaller context. So it both gives us a platform for being able to say things with a degree of confidence about how the model's working, as well as a, a sense of confidence about what will happen with the model when we um, recreate it in a non-bespoke corpus context. Yeah, and then Peggy, it's a super brilliant question. Thanks for um, inviting us to dilate a little bit more about the difference between why we went to the On Being podcast episodes and then when we went to the Buckeye conversation. I could have elaborated much more on what that is, so I'm happy to do so. Um, we know uh, from theory and from years of studying what therapy is, and also for Kendra practicing, she literally had to leave to go practice therapy. Um, we know that therapy is a kind of strange social interaction. It's a hyper-structured form of dialogue across modality, irrespective of which modality. We know that it's dialogue, but we also know that it's kind of supposed to go in a certain way. It's very targeted. It has outcomes, has a very clear beginning and end, the analytic hour, and hence it has a kind of trajectory or plot in general. Um, so similarly, a podcast episode has been kind of uh, massaged. It's been kind of uh, curated, if you will. There's an interviewer, there's someone who's being interviewed. And we actually specifically chose the On Being corpus because uh, if you're familiar with that podcast, it's, um, it's, it's, it's like very stylized and it tends to be about like existential things like life and death and music. And they're always interviewing philosophers and musicians and stuff like that. So there we thought that it would be interesting to compare the dialogue from Chicago Bradley from the bespoke corpus and the scenes that incorporated both narration and dialogue from the bespoke corpus to that hyperstructured dialogue. By contrast, the dialogue in the Buckeye conversation corpus is the closest thing that we could come up with to sort of unscripted dialogue. So it's a free conversation. Now it is um, sort of uh, topically kind of um, circumscribed because it's, uh, I think I said it's, it's college students. So they're tending to talk about things like, you know, my dorm and what classes I'm taking and being away from home. Hence why we didn't really present any results like topical results because it's not very interesting to say like these conversations are about school and these ones are not but the way of speaking because we're looking at part of speech and at semantics we could compare the sort of structured versus more unstructured conversation but we invite um other comparative corpora and i saw that eric uh fredner put in the chat that the internet archive has a television and radio transcripts so we could we could very easily run our uh studies on that too and see if it sort of holds does that, does that help, Peggy? Sorry. 
Uh, yes, it, it does. I mean, honestly, I, I still find it uh, problematic, but I, I get what you're saying. And um, I imagine the problems with me. I, I just, I don't know. It just makes me, I, I don't know. I think this is much larger than your project. It's about digital humanities. It's a, you know, it's a larger qu question, but thank you for your generous answer. I did have one uh, question, um, and I was just wondering, because you say this is, uh, Mark, you referenced or referred to this as a pilot program uh, or pilot project. I was wondering if you have thought, if either of you have thought about expanding it to maybe other corp corpora that unfortunately would be bespoke, and, uh, and it could be like queer lit or Native American and indigenous literatures, because um, you, I can imagine it's a bit, maybe a bit reductive, but uh, kind of historical and contemporary trauma being uh, teased out through by authors in these texts. And so I'm wondering if you've thought about um, expanding through uh, in, in kind of those directions uh, into that kind of tailored corpora. I think that's a really interesting idea and I think it's something that we'd want to think about. I also think it's something that we want to be really, really careful about. Um, as Anna highlighted, there's a real danger here in terms of other, other approaches to this, which have really focused on a certain kind of pathologizing. And we'd have to be really, really careful that it didn't um, have any sense in which we were trying to use the kind of things that we're doing um, to do any kind of work that, that would be akin to um, pathologizing particularly um, unrepresented, uh, underrepresented groups. Um, the other thing I think we'd want to take incredible care to do, um, and, and, and sort of an acknowledgement that we made at the outset, but I think it's worth sort of focusing on, is our therapy corpus is actually really small. We've depended on Kendra um, and, the, and the corpus that she brought um, and hand transcribed and, and cleaned and, and anonymized. And we're working on increasing that. Um, but because of privacy concerns, the, the pace at which that can happen is necessarily slow. So I think before we started to do work like you're describing, although I really, really like it, and, and you know, as an end goal, I think that would be fantastic, I would feel a lot more comfortable if we had a larger, ideally more representative base of, of therapeutic texts that we could then go in and start to be much more nuanced about the kinds of resemblances that we see. Thank you. Uh, and so we have time for one last question. Uh, Leah. Hi, everybody. I think this was fabulous. I can't believe that you are able to achieve results like that, but I am so impressed that I, I had two suggestions here just in terms of um, expansions. And it struck me that journals might be something that would be a, another type of corpus. There are numerous journals. Some of them are travel journals. Some of them are adventure journals. But journaling is also thought to be a highly therapeutic activity. Yes. So it would be curious to see how journals match up as you know a, a, another, another data source. The other question that I wanted to ask, though, was about sentiment analysis and whether if the, if the texts were coded for sentiment analysis, I would guess you would get some fairly good match, but perhaps not quite as good as the amazing results you've gotten with parts of speech. Any thoughts on that? Might I take the first one, uh, Mark, about, okay, thanks so much for your really kind words, Leah. Um, I love the idea of uh, doing this on journals. It raises this perennial issue for me in building the bespoke corpus of literary uh, therapeutic dyads um, about whether or not we should put Anais Nin's diaries in, uh, mm -hmm. which are not novels. Mm -hmm course. Uh, and we opted not to because they're not novels, but it would be <laughs> very interesting. Um, we put a nice men's novels instead. Um, but I really like that idea is the basic answer. And then Mark, if you want to say we did do sentiment analysis. Uh, so uh, yeah, we did. Um, I, I'll just add to the journals that you're sort of bringing together um, 
two halves of my brain at the moment because I'm working with a, with a different group of grad students over in the um, environmental sciences where we're looking at journaling experiences of people in nature and trying to extract um, the, I mean, in many ways, uh, the therapeutic experience of, of, of understanding and encountering nature from journals. So I can see the ways in which these, these two things touch definitely. Um, we did do sentiment analysis. I'm gonna be frank, I, I mistrust sentiment analysis deeply, um, especially in its current state of the art and particularly for these kinds of, these kinds of uses for which sentiment analysis was not um, necessarily um, designed for. So, so long story short, um, the results that we got were inconclusive and I think they'd remain so and I wouldn't wanna say anything about them until we had done the work to train a new sentiment analysis model that um, takes account of the kind of data that we have in our corpus. Um, so until that point, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply wary of it, but I love well, the idea of journals. 